what to help us to admire. It's a question of which toil is worthwhile. It's a question of which toil will give me the best pleasure. Which toil will give me the enduring pleasure. That is what it is about. So as we go through it, let us not have sleep. I think sleep perhaps is the only thing that is not vain because we are not toiling, we are simply resting. We thank God for sleep. So please sleep, it's profitable. But, but I want us, as we go through this text, what everything else. Yani, what is that one work? What is that one effort in this world that we can do? That we would rather pursue it at the expense of everything else. That we would put forth as the top most and the prime most toil among above all else. That is what we hope to answer today. So let's begin with an introduction of chapter 2 because we're only looking at half of it. Rightly, we are supposed to look at all of chapter 2 together, but also time, may not, time might not allow us to do so. So chapter 1 verse 17, look at chapter 1 verse 17. And I applied my heart to know two things, wisdom and to know madness and the and folly, but I'll, we'll see that they are the same actually. Two contrasts, wisdom, madness, or wisdom, folly. And if you notice, that's what he'll come and do in chapter 2. Look at verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 1. That's chapter 2, verse 12. I've looked at the pleasures. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. What is this madness and this folly? Look at chapter 2, verse 2. I said of laughter, it is mad. I said of laughter, it is mad. When you look at chapter 7, verse 25, Madness and folly are said to be the same. Verse 25, I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. So let's not come here looking for something different or difficult. No, it's what he's simply continuing. And now in chapter 2, after he has told us in chapter 1 what he has now applied his heart to know, Look at how chapter 2 begins. He said, I said in my heart. Now he's applying in his heart. And so he is now beginning. So I want us to come to chapter 2, understanding this. Verse 1 to verse 11, he's simply examining folly and madness. And then verse 12 to 24, he's going to compare the madness and the folly with the wisdom that he has. So that he may see which is better. What is better for man to do in this world? A pursuit of madness, a pursuit of folly, an engagement. And when we look at madness here, we are speaking about pleasures. But also I want us to understand that this madness or this foolishness is not just an outcome of pleasure. But it is, when you look at chapter 7, verse 7, it is also an outcome of oppression. Chapter 10, verse 13, it is also an outcome of foolish talking. But for now, for today, we are going to look at pleasure itself. We're going to be looking at pleasure itself. And as I was reading, I think something worth noticing is that the author, Solomon, will tend to uh, direct all these pleasures to himself. It's as if he's doing it to himself or himself by himself. It's as if Solomon has made himself to be, he has surrounded himself with the pleasure. It's, it's for him. It is by him, and it is from him. Notice of the words like, I, I, no, not God, I. I chose, I made, for who? For me. For me. I did it by myself, for myself. Not for anyone else. For, not for my wife, not for my children, not for anyone. For me. And that's key for us also as we look at the text. And so we're going to divide this, chap this section, chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, into two points.
the world and you realize it's not what it all seemed. And you just simply go with whatever that will go. Solomon is here looking for that better toil. And he begins his search where? He begins it in his heart. All things, just as Proverbs 4.23 will say, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Solomon is saying, I said in my heart, chapter 2, verse 1, come now, you'll test with pleasure, enjoy yourself. Where is all these things beginning? It's beginning here. This is where everything begins. We can never excuse ourselves, ourselves like Adam saying, Eve made me, the world made me, I had no choice, my circumstances made me. No. It started here. The contemplation of it started here. It wasn't his circumstances. It wasn't his situation. It was his heart. Why is Solomon searching? Not because there wa there's nothing in the world, because his heart is empty. That's why. He's looking for that which will fill his heart. In his heart, he commits himself to test the pleasure, to test the enjoyments. What is he hoping for? To find that better toil. Which will, and how will he know it's the better toil? By simply looking at the pleasure he will receive. Will it be a satisfactory pleasure? If it is a satisfa satisfactory pleasure, then the toil which has been put in getting it, then that is a worthy toil. And that's what Solomon is hoping to do. It is the heart that's facing the problem of dissatisfaction, saints. The problem is here. And here we are learning something unique and something interesting. In chapter 1, we saw the problem with the world. We saw the world, we cannot fix it. And now in chapter 2, Solomon is showing us we also can't. The problem is not just with the world. But the problem is also in our hearts. And we can't fix it. You can't fix your heart. It, no, no, no time, no eternity will ever fix your heart. They say time heals the wounds of that. No, not this wound. Not this wound of emptiness. No time will heal it. Then they say enjoy, give yourself, distract yourself with that. No distraction will heal the emptiness in your heart. No, not one. No, not one. The problem Solomon is showing us is the problem of the heart. And as it is custom, just as in chapter 1, Solomon begins with the conclusion of the matter. He always begins with the conclusion of the matter. Before he tells you his findings, he'll always give you his conclusion. And notice chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I have, this is my test. This is what I'm planning to do. Enjoy yourself. And then, even he hasn't told us how he's going to enjoy himself. He's already said, behold, this also was vanity. In other words, Solomon is saying, even before you go any further, it's vanity. Enjoyment, vain, vanity. It is empty, it is without profit. Look at what he'll say in chapter, two, verse, in chapter 2, verse 2. I said of laughter, it is mad. It is madness. And of pleasure, what use is it? It is worthless. What benefit, what gain do I get from it? And here when he's saying about pleasure, actually the word pleasure here is not the same with the word in chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1, is the pleasure which suits Solomon. Solomon is actually pursuing the pleasures which are suitable for him. Not suitable for everyone, suitable for him. What does he enjoy doing? That's what he's pursuing. And so we understand that Solomon is selecting, very specific in what he's selecting to enjoy. He's very specific. For example, if you don't enjoy building, you won't go and test building because you already know you don't love building. Solomon loved it. Solomon enjoyed all these things which he's doing, and that's why he has carefully selected them. For those who enjoy singing, you'll go and test singing and see whether it will give you the pleasure you want. And now in chapter 2, verse 2, he'll, say, he'll speak of this pleasure. He's, he's speaking about the climax of pleasure, that highest pleasure. When it is in excess, he's saying, even when that pleasure is in excess, what use is it? It is worthless. It's almost resounding with Romans 3. All have become worthless. Together with your appetites, even in the very pursuit of them. Worthless men pursuing worthless satisfactions. Worthless men pursuing worthless satisfactions. That's what Solomon is telling us here. 
And we must understand that this is going back to the fall. We are going back to the Adamic age, where it all began. And look at what his conclusions are. Chapter 2, verse 1, he'll say, All pursuits of pleasure are vanity. The pleasure itself is vanity. The pursuit of it is vanity. The toil, the toil you put to get it is vanity. Whatever it is that you're getting it is also vanity. Why am I saying this? He's actually creating a frame. He says it's all vanity. Look at chapter 2, verse 11 at the end. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. Notice all, all that my hands had done. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained, nothing to be gained under the sun. Nothing. No, not even one. Chapter 2, verse 2, he'll speak of it, of laughter, yielding madness, exceeding joy, simply being unprofitable and without gain, as we've seen. Chapter 2, verse 3, he'll speak about Look at when he said, I searched with my heart how to cheer, how to cheer my body. Actually, the word cheer means to prolong. How can I prolong the enjoyment of wine? How can I prolong my self-indulgences? How can I make them to be long, yet still being guided by wisdom? If it is to drink, how do I prolong the drinking? Perhaps to be taking small sips of, small sips of whatever I'm drinking? Slowly by slowly to prolong so that I can enjoy, perhaps to be swallowing it in the bottle as we see in the movies and then smelling and seeing whether it is nice. Come on, it's sodo ikunyo pole pole. Wamoto mi estro juktu miam domo itenda mingi. How to prolong the enjoyment? Come on, inyamo kule kidogo kidogo. Come on, chulpo atotul kona zana sausage juna toa kwanza kavenge. Kula zandani alafu nuna malzia enge. How do we prolong the enjoyment? That's what Solomon is saying. How do I prolong this enjoyment of my body with wine? And yet still maintaining the guidance of my heart. And then he'll say, and how to lay hold on fully. It's as if I'm pursuing this until I lay hold on the climax of it, which ultimately is already concluding it is folly. It is folly. It is foolishness. The peculiar thing about what Solomon is actually doing even, it's this. Solomon will subject himself to various pleasures so as to determine what is good for all men to do. This is interesting. It's very interesting. Listen to what Solomon is doing. Solomon is saying, I've given myself to pleasure to enjoy myself, that I may find out what, that I may find out what was good for everyone else to do in the world. I'm giving myself to my pleasures that I may find out from my pleasures what is good for everyone else to do in the world. And this is peculiar because each one of us, we have our own unique enjoyments. I know Brother Dan enjoys construction work. For me personally, I enjoy playing basketball. I know of other people who enjoy watching movies, others who enjoy walking, others who enjoy just sitting. It's their pleasure, it's their satisfaction. Others enjoy playing games, Sikukucha, Billy, and the Nakombredzwake. We all have unique enjoyments. But, but here's Solomon saying, I want to evaluate my enjoyments that I may find out what is good for every one of you in the world to do. And, and, and if you notice the peculiar thing here is this. Solomon is actually saying, as I'm searching for that one thing which is worthwhile to do, Solomon is saying, or the text even, through the, remember we said when we began that this text is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it is instructed. Solomon is, this is what Solomon is telling us. As I'm searching for that one thing, using myself as the test subject, and that one thing which I find for myself will be this, should be the same for everyone. That's what he's saying. This is what Solomon is saying. Solomon is saying there's only one solution. For man. There's only one uniform toil for every man in this world. Only one toil which will satisfy every heart of every man. And Solomon is saying, the emptiness in every man's heart is the same. The emptiness in every man's heart is the same. Though Brother Dan is satisfied with construction and I with playing basketball, still, just because we have a variety of enjoyments, still that will not satisfy our hearts. There's something more that should be uniform amongst all of us. 
And that's why we are having each and every person has, we all have different delights. And that shows us that then one of the delights should be wrong, or all, all of them should be wrong. There should be only one true delight. There should be only that one true satisfaction. And Solomon is saying there's only one worthwhile toil. There's only one worthwhile toil that will give you that worthwhile satisfaction. And that's what Solomon is pursuing. And that's why he's using himself as, his, as a test subject, and rightly so. Why? Because he is as fallen as you are. He is as fallen as you are, descendant of Adam. We are all fallen creatures. And we are all simply searching as Solomon. That's why we keep on skipping from one pleasure to another. That's why sometimes I get bored with playing basketball. I get tired, I get wearied. If it was a true pleasure, I should never be tired of it, wearied of it. I should be fully satisfied with it, not constantly going each day to get my dose of enjoyment. And that's what Solomon is looking for. And that's what Solomon is hoping to find for every one of us. It is also peculiar because in the manner in which he searches. Look, look at where he is. And he only needs to find again. I am the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And twice he will say that in chapter 1. King in Jerusalem. Keep a toil he will find as worthwhile. Can you imagine if Solomon was to choose sex as the satisfaction of man, as the worthwhile toil? Then what should we expect in Israel? Brothels everywhere. I'm not even speaking something strange. Look at Kenya. What is our president? What, is our, what does our president think is the solution of our country's problem? Houses. Houses. And because it is his desire, he has already inflicted. And he's making you to also embrace what he thinks to be right. Right. And that's how powerful his decision is as a king. And we must appreciate that. We must appreciate that. And therefore we'll say if it's construction that will, would have been at the heart of Solomon will be the toil that Solomon would have found most profitable, then many people in Israel perhaps would have been builders, many would have owned houses. If it was food, then we would have had perhaps many, many hotels in Israel. I don't know, I'm just using an example. So if our President Ruto was a fond of seafood, we'll be having a lot of sea seafoods in Kenya. Almost a sea depot in every, in every county. If he, was a, if he thought transport would solve our problems, we'll be, he would be investing in transport more. And that is Solomon. We also, like Solomon, we, we are not so different. The world has presented to us a variety of enjoyments, a variety of delights. Actually, the world has crafted each delight to suit you. And it, and it has designed it so well that if you get tired, if you get bored, they, they'll present you with another one, an alternative. And, and perhaps if you think uh, one delight is not enough, they'll tell you, you can still get more than one. If you find more than one is not enough, they'll still tell you, perhaps you're not paying enough. Give more, pay more that you may get more. The world has crafted for us every delight that we can pursue, that we desire. And we, with our appetites, we've gathered around the table of the world to feast, to feast just as he did, hoping that perhaps as I choose A, B, C, D, appetite A, appetite B, as I satisfy it, perhaps that will quiet my heart, that will ease the ache in my heart. For many of us, the world has become our king, determining for us which is better to do and which one is not better to do. Which one will best satisfy you? Which one will not best satisfy you? They design for you all kinds of delights. If it's fashion, there are some who find their satisfaction in fashion. If it's, if it's sexual immorality, they've given you all opportunities. Even if you want to do it in secret, they've, given for, they've provided for you the internet to do it in secret. So, so that we can just, they can satisfy you. If it's spending, if, it's, if you have excess money and you don't know what to do, they've given for you all kinds of things on where to spend. They can make a chair specifically for you, which they'll make you buy it at 100,000 and yet you can buy it at 1,000. 
they've ensured that they've, they've held you firmly. They've ensured that they've blinded you well, that you cannot go anywhere. We have gathered around the table of the world, and the world is serving us, and oh, our mouths are wide open. Our mouths are wide open. The pursuits of Solomon can be divided into two. When you look at verse 4 to 8, they can be divided as the pride of life and the possessions of life. Verse 4 to 6, why am I saying the pride of life? Because Solomon here in his pursuit, Solomon did, did not just do some small things, no. Solomon, Solomon did great things. He did great things. I would argue greater than perhaps any king, as the Bible will say, in his time. Solomon did great works. Look at what he's saying in verse 4. And, and this is not boasting. This is not bragging. This is true. I made great works. That was his pride in life. And these great works were in their variety. He made great works, plenty of works. He made houses, he made vineyards, he made gardens, he made parks, he made plantations, he made trees, he made pools, all for himself by himself. He made them for himself by himself. He made them. And also his works are great because each work was unique on its own. It stood out on its own. That's how great his works were. That his house will take 13 years. And the only reason in Kenya we take 13 years to build it is because of finances. He had all the finances and it took him 13 years. I think it's 13. I hope it's 13. But we can agree it was more than 10 years to build. This was his pride in life. Each work unique on its own. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 20. First Kings, First Kings chapter 10, verse 20, this is what it will be said. While 12 lions stood there, one on each end of a step on the six steps, the like of it was never made in any, any kingdom. Solomon was not just obsessed in building. He was obsessed with building that which was totally different, totally unique. And just before you think that you are, you, are, you are not Solomon, you don't have the money, you don't pursue uniqueness, look at the things you try to put on Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. You're always wanting to do something unique that you can stand out. You always want to post something differently. Look at even how you think or reason on certain things. You don't want to think or reason like the people of old. You want to do it in a new way. Look at the sermons people preach, people preach these days on the, on the pulpit, even among the reformed. We want to do it in a new way in a new style, forgetting the word is the same and it has never changed. The preaching remains the same, it never changes. You're not different. The only difference is you don't have the money that Solomon had. That's the only difference. But oh my, your pursuits and your interests and your inklings are one and the same. Constantly in pursuit of that one thing, the pride of life, to be called great. Because isn't that what Solomon was called? Isn't that what was his praise? Solomon was called great. Solomon's, great wo Solomon's works were so great that even the queen of Sheba will be taken out. Her breath will be taken away. Uh, men, men I, I, I don't know if this is still working today. If you want to win a queen, perhaps, yes, you need to take her breath away by the majesty of your possessions. Look at chapter 10, verse 4, 1 Kings. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servant, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offering, and th that he had offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. Oh my, Solomon will prepare a feast to impress. He will prepare a feast to impress from how the servants would arrange and dress. I don't think there's any monarchy that can relate or that we can even compare, even in our time now.
and you think that's the, 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 that's only on the pride of life. Look, look at on the look, look at the possessions of life that he had. Solomon had great possessions. Uh, let's just look at his salary. And let's look at his yearly annual income. Look at First Kings chapter ten verse fourteen. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon is in one year was six hundred and sixty-six talents of gold. Uh, and by this, the six 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 is not in any way related to Revelation. Besides that which came from the explorers and from the business of the merchants and from all the kings of the West and from the governors of the land. Now that is that, that is besides all this that came from other people. Look at verse 16. King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold, 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. And you may think that's, what, that's all Solomon had. No. Look again. Look again at verse 21. Look again at verse 21. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. All. Not some. All. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None was of silver. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. The only silver I have in my life is my ring. If you think that's enough, look at verse 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in, chariot, in, the chariots, in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. Verse 27. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. I wish he would be our president today. I don't know how he did it. But my, this man was filthy rich. He had more money than, what he, than his expenditure. He had more money than he knew what, how even how to spend it. Solomon, Solomon if, if Solomon was to seek after pleasure, Solomon had the means. And Solomon actually did what required recognition. Saints, I don't know what you're trusting God for today or even in the near future? Is it money? Is it a spouse, the, the, the beautiful woman in life? Is it, is it a car, a business, a house, a good investment deal? Children, a holiday, or a healing because of our disease? As you desire and plead for this, as you plead to God for this, what does your heart hope to gain from it all? What does your heart hope to gain from it all? We've seen Solomon how he pursued after the pleasures of the world, after the greatness and the praises of the world. Now let's see the results of it, the second point. Let's look at the results, vain results, verse, verse 9 to 11. Solomon who had all the, he had all the possessions that this world could give. Solomon by his great works came admiration he was admired. Oh my, Solomon was greatly admired. He was greatly praised. He was greatly honored. He was People were amazed whenever they would see him, see his work. And yet, even in his greatness, surpassing every earthly king before him and in his time. Yes, Solomon surpassed every earthly king in his time and before his time. And even scripture will profess that. When you read 1 Kings 10, 23 to 24. And even Ecclesiastes 2, 9. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. All. All. But you know in Kenya we can have the president, but he's not the richest person in Kenya. Oh, by my, he was the king and he was the richest person in the known lands then. I would say the known lands then. And still, and still Solomon will say he did not find anything good in all his toil which man can engage himself in. He did not find anything good which any man can engage himself in. As I said, we are a generation who wants to be noticed. If, if, if you are an architect, you want to build that unique house that will stand out from the rest and get praises from it and be called great. We want our names to be in every person's lips. We want to have that good biography. 
We want to make a name for ourselves. We are willing to do anything, anything, to become anything, so long as it gets us the likes and the approvals of the world. We are concerned when the world disapproves us. We are concerned. I think it's Pastor Kogo who normally rebukes young men, saying, you put a post on Facebook and every time unashiko na alsas ju, unangale unapata, hakuna mwenyame like. After one hour, on a scroll, hakuna mwenyame like, unashiko na alsas. We are concerned. We want to be approved. Uneka post kwa group ya church, unashanga, hakuna mwenyame amifinya, ameka baton ya maumi. No one is saying yes. There are times we put posts as pastors na unashanga, hakuna ata, Ada, thank you. We are concerned when the world disapproves us. We are concerned. Solomon had all the approval, not just from common men. No, he had the approval of kings. He had their praises. If there was a song to be written about Solomon, oh my, then they were written. They were written. If there were poems to be written about him, then they were written. His praises were on each person's lips. Everyone who would come to Solomon, they would journey find why just to see the man. To see the man in his splendor. To see the man in his possessions in the world. And they would be swept off their feet. Yet he would say that all the toil expended in gaining all these praises is worthless. What use is it? What use? Many of us even many of us here even we don't own a home. But trust you me, just because you don't own a home, don't try and think of yourself that you're not like Solomon. You are in his shoes in every way because you have the same heart as he has. A heart that is fallen. A heart that is fallen, a heart that is sinful. Solomon by his great possessions he was able to meet all his needs. Whatever he wanted, he got. Whatever he wanted, he got. Look at verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Many of us here, if we were to do this, we would be in cells, because we don't have the money to get what our eyes desire. Most of the things we want in this life, we cannot get it because we don't have the ability, we don't have the authority, we don't have the money. But Solomon is saying, if I, set my, if I had set my eyes on a woman and I wanted her, I got her. If I set my eyes on an animal and I wanted it, I got it. Solomon says he did not keep his eyes from whatever that he desired. He says that he did not keep his heart from any pleasure. There was no pleasure beyond, beyond his reach. There was no pleasure beyond his reach. In other words, we are saying in this world today, no earthly joy, no earthly entertainment. If Solomon was in our day, it was in our timeline now. There was nothing that Solomon wouldn't get. Many of us here, as I said, we only hindered to pursue it in the manner that Solomon did because of our lack of money as he did. But just give us some bit of coin and we will show you how to enjoy. Just give us some bit of coin and we will show you how to enjoy. Solomon had all the silver, the gold, the palatial houses. He had the workforce. A workforce which was well ordered, well trained. I imagine, imagine sitting at a table where you have your, your help or your servants in the house. You don't need to tell them remove, they already know. They know, which, they know which meal best suits you at which particular day, at which particular time. Solomon had the best chef. If it was a, if it was a, if it was a matter of exotic animals, he had all the animals. Actually, it will be written in 1 Kings 10. He would send ships to just simply bring what? Bring peacocks and apes. Ships, ships, not just one ship, ships. Meli, Meli, Kuleta, Peacock, and Apes. Just for his amusement and entertainment. And if he wants to slaughter one, he can slaughter one. Solomon had more women than the total number of seats in our church. 
Actually, the church we are planning to build, if Solomon was to be the only member, we are set for life. Because even our church, I don't think, would accommodate him and his wives. A thousand women by his side. And you haven't counted the children. Saints, you need to understand this, and you need to see this as serious as perhaps I do. Because despite all this, Solomon will still say it was all vanity, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. They don't think you're going to do it better. Don't think that Solomon had some certain hindrances. Solomon did not know how to enjoy the women well. And you were panga vizuri style flan. And you, no, Solomon had it all. Had the means to attain it all. If it was a house, Solomon had it. The best house. Perhaps I'm talking about a house that is a smart house. You get in and it calls your name. Hello, Ian. Welcome, Ian. Do you want the lights on? Yes. How bright? Slightly bright. And they, it's automatic. You don't need to do anything. Solomon had it all. Though, though, though not that technology, but he had servants who would adjust the lamps the way he wanted. Saints, a well-ordered and governed house won't bring you lasting joy. Women, hallelujah. A well-ordered, structured house won't give, bring you lasting joy. A neat house won't bring you lasting joy. Nor will the big houses we build bring us any lasting joy or any lasting satisfaction, no matter how much effort we put into them. It's not a matter of how much effort you've put that will make you be more appreciative of what you have. No. It doesn't matter how much effort you put in. We're telling you Solomon built his house for more than 10 years. And still he will say nothing. What use is it? It brought me no pleasure, no gain. It was all vanity. Build one in Kisumu, one in Nairobi, one in Nyandarua, one in every county, so that when you go, you have your own house. Still, it won't profit you in any way. Your heart will remain as empty as those houses that you've built. Young men, young women, even if you are to, marry the, to be married or to marry the Miss or Mr. Kenya, still that won't bring you any joy or lasting satisfaction. Neither will all the silver and the gold of this world. Even if you are to get a full return of all your investments, even if you are to get a full return of all your investments, even if your business was to give you 100% profit, that still won't satisfy your heart. Nothing will. Let me tell you this, saints, even if the world was to be fair, even if the world was to be fair. Because notice what Solomon will say. Look at verse 10. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. Can you imagine? Solomon is saying, I found pleasure in all my toil. Not a single toil was lost, including the thousand women. All my toil, including the pools and the houses and the, all my toil. Not a single pleasure was lost. I did not undergo any loss. All my toil. And he says, this was my reward. And you'll appreciate that reward perhaps when we be looking next Sunday at chapter 2, verse 24. Solomon is saying, I got everything back. I got everything in full return. What I dispensed, I was able to yield in full return. And this is what Solomon is saying. This is what he's saying. Even if life was to be fair, even if life was to be designed such that we get a full reward for all our labors. If you are a farmer, even if the land was to be designed such that what you plant is what you reap and even more. Still, you will remain dissatisfied. You will remain dissatisfied. Even if that top of yours was to give you a full return and more, you will remain dissatisfied. Even if your investments in your children were to give you a full return, you will remain dissatisfied. Even if you are to get the best, the most prettiest, the most beautiful woman in the world, you will still remain dissatisfied. You will still want more and more and more. And yes, Solomon is telling us the problem of life isn't just outside of us. The problem of life is inside of us. Because even if the problems of the world were to be solved, 
and the world was to be made a better place, still our hearts will remain the worst place. And the problem, this is the problem. There's no, there's no going anywhere without your heart. You carry it everywhere, and it is with you everywhere. The problem of life is within us also, saints. That's what Solomon is telling us. And even if the world was to be made a better place, we, we still wouldn't find joy, lasting joy. Our problems run too deep. They run too deep for any surface feeling to hide the hole. They run too deep, way, way deeper than even the earth's core. The depth of our emptiness is eternity. No one can feel it. No man can discern it. We'll look at it in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. No man can discern how empty we are. That's why we keep on trying to fill things which will never, they'll never fit. They'll never fit. It's like having a jigsaw puzzle and that missing piece, you can't find it anywhere. And no matter how many times you try and craft it and design it, it still won't fit. We are also a generation like Solomon who says that, I did not keep my eyes from anything that I desired. We are a generation that also constantly is concerned with satisfying our eyes. We want what we see, regardless of whether we actually need it or not. Why do you want this? Well, I've seen it. Do you need it? I'm not sure. I'll find a use for it in the house. Just buy. We want because we see. And that's what Solomon will even say. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. Why do we want? We want because others have it. That's what he'll say in, in, actually in Ecclesiastes 3. Why is it that we want? He'll come and not even 3 but 4. He'll say in chapter 4 verse 4, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. Can you evaluate the thing that you want now? You just think of that one thing that you want, truly want in life now. And then ask yourself, where are it, so, what are the origins of your want? Are they from you, truly from you? Or have they been influenced even in the smallest degree because another has it? Our need is determined by the fact that another has it and we don't. And we think that when we satisfy our eyes, when we get what we want, we can be at your window shopping, turn your cooker, turn your washing machine, and we think, oh my, if I get that, I will be fine. I'll be okay. I'll be satisfied. You walk in people's houses, you see their wives or their husbands, and you say, yes, if I get a man like that, a woman like that, nitakuasa, I'll be set. Don't lie to yourself. You won't. You won't. If you think I'm lying, ask the men and the women in that house. Ask them truly and sincerely. We have therefore engaged ourselves in unhealthy competitions against one another. Instead of outdoing one another in love, we are outdoing one another with the best functioning TV. Who has the most beautiful lady? Who has the best and most unique house? Who is the guru investor? Who has the coolest hairstyle? whose child is getting the best education, whose child can speak a better English. We are constantly competing. And the, and the worst part is this. We, we are not even aware that we are competing. That's the worst part of it. We compete even without being aware that we are. We want and we will justify our want and find ways of circulating ministry around it, the gospel around it, so as to make it more appealing to others but deep down in our hearts we know why we want it's not because of any reason we give or make the people know and yes your conscience will stand against you before god our eyes have failed to search out opportunities for rendering love and instead they've searched out opportunities for coveting what they don't have we no longer look at how much our fellow brothers and sisters love but we rather look at how much they have. We no longer look at our pastors' lives through the lenses of faith and emulate them as Hebrews 13, 7 will tell us. Instead, we look at their lives through the lenses of what they own and hence desire to have as they do. Can we go back to where we are supposed to be? Can we go back to seeing what the Lord called us to see 
amongst one another. That we may see a brother in need and help them, not simply just look at the brother who has and want. That we may see the show of love and be sad in our hearts to pursue the same, to imitate the same. Not to see what they have and want what they possess. We need to go back to using our eyes the way we ought to use them. We need to go back. Solomon looked at all the things he had. And he concludes that all of it was vanity. And he says it's like the wind. You think you've held it? Suddenly it is out of your hand. Have you ever tried catching the wind? That's the same way. It, it's similar to you trying to satisfy your heart. You, you're simply trying to catch the wind. And every time you think you've held it, it was even never in your hands in the first place. It was never there. The, what's the conclusion of the matter as we conclude? This is the conclusion of the matter, saints. We have a king who sought to find what was best for the children of man to do, what was best for his subjects to do. And this king, with all his wisdom, is humbled, for he finds nothing worthwhile to be done. But we, we have another king who comes under the sun, the king of kings, the one who is also a descendant of David. He comes to the world and he shows us the better toil that yields everlasting gain. And we may wonder, what toil is this, O Lord Jesus, that you showed us? Jesus, when you came to this earth, you being king, you being a descendant of David, what did you do? What gave you satisfaction? What gave you that great joy and pleasure? Let me show you some few verses which Jesus was greatly satisfied. What are some of the works that Jesus did that greatly satisfied him? And as we read this, I want us to really ponder on them. Look at Isaiah 53, 11. Isaiah 53, 11. I hope you are there. I'll read. There are some verses which you read and you just need to pause a bit. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Who shall Jesus see and be satisfied? You. You. You whom by his knowledge he has made righteous. How has he done so? By purchasing you. Becoming the very man of sorrows. Our Lord Jesus sees you. Sees his work in you, upon you. And our Lord Jesus says, I am satisfied with this work. But that's why he'll say, good and faithful servant, come and enter my rest. He sees you and he is satisfied. As if that is not enough. Look at Isaiah 62, 5. Just move, in, move some few chapters ahead. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Just picture for a moment Jesus Christ rejoicing. Rejoicing over you. Because of his work that he has done to you. To make you his own. This is our Lord. That as he suffered, as he died, he rejoiced. He was glad and he was satisfied by his work upon you. And you may think perhaps, per se, and these are just images. How can God stand up and rejoice? Well, he stood up and Stephen, when Stephen was dying. But let me show you how our Lord actually rejoices. Turn to Zephaniah 3.14. Zephaniah 3, 14 to 16. I'll read only verse 15 and verse 16. Sorry, verse, verse 15 and verse 17. The rest you can read on your own. Zephaniah chapter 3. 
The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the King of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Oh, that my Lord Jesus will sing over me. Jesus rejoices over his work on you. What satisfied our Lord? What rejoiced? Where did Jesus get his joy? In simply obeying his Father. Because all these things that Jesus did, he'll say, I have come to do the will of my Father. And that's what he'll tell the disciples in, when he's, after he has talked to the Samaritan woman. I, have, I am satisfied with a food that is not of this world. What food is that? To do the will of God. And then he'll go on and tell the disciples, look at the field, how they are ripe for harvest. And then he'll say that the harvester and the sower and the reaper come and they rejoice together. How can we emulate our Lord Jesus in this? By also making his desires our own, his interests our own. What, are they, what were his interests? The will of God. What was the will of God? To save mankind, to bring them to himself, to reconcile them to himself. And the apostles learned this well. When you look at perhaps 3 John 3 to 4, I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. This is Elder John saying, I rejoiced greatly. And then he'll go on to say in verse 4, I have no greater joy. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That is John rejoicing over believers. That's where he's finding his greatest joy. Or Paul in Philippians 4.1, he'll call the Philippian church my crown and my joy. Or Matthew 13, 44, the believer, when they are saved, when he finds the kingdom of God, what does he do? He goes in his joy. To find the kingdom of God is to find joy. Saints, our problem is in our heart. No labor can and will satisfy our souls because we are fallen. How can we come back to delighting in the labors we do? By turning to Jesus to fix our hearts first. Now let me tell you this. There is no way you are going to enjoy any toil on this earth until Jesus first of all satisfies your heart. Because the longings that you yearn for in your heart, they, they can never be filled by any trinkets of this world or any chest of gold in this world. Gain all the world. Even Jesus will say, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Jesus will agree with Solomon. Go ahead, gain the whole world. But trust you me, you will remain as empty as ever. Only Jesus can fill you. Only Jesus can satisfy you. And that's why he'll even say in Isaiah 55, why, why, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Why? Why, saints? Can you ask yourself, why? Why do you keep on laboring day and night for that which will never satisfy your soul? Why not go to him who is the satisfier, the one who fills our souls, the wellspring of life, the bread of life. To him, when we go to, we'll never thirst, we'll never hunger. Why not go to him? Why are you wasting your labor and your efforts and you know clearly it won't work? How do you know it won't work? You've been trying it since you were born. You've been trying it since you were born. One after another after another, thinking when I leave my father's house, I'll be free and I'll enjoy life. Are you enjoying it now? Some of us think it's better being in our father's houses, especially in this regime of taxation. I'd rather be a child again. It won't work. It won't work, saints. So turn to Jesus, I would say. First Peter 1 8, Peter will speak of us loving Jesus, believing in Jesus, and what, what is happening? And we are rejoicing in Jesus with inexpressible glory filled with joy. And yet he's saying this, we are in this joy and yet we are suffering. Solomon is in plentifulness. Solomon has a lot, but he's in sorrow and despair. 
Can you imagine the greatness of the joy of Jesus that in sorrow, we are still rejoicing in, in, with inexpressible joy in glory. And yet this man here with all that he has, he will say, still yet, it's wearisome, it's burdensome. Now imagine having the joy of Jesus in plenty, because that's how eternity will be. Imagine having the joy of Jesus without sorrow, because that's how eternity will be. Again, I submit to you, it was never about, it was never about which should I work or should I not work? No, it was about which is the best toil that will give me satisfactory pleasure. And God will say through his word, it is our life of obedience in the faith. Go to your workplace. Yes, it is vanity because you won't change a thing in this world. True. But you will still go because of the obedience in faith. You will still go because of a greater and surpassing work, a greater inheritance beyond this world. And that is which we have in Jesus Christ. Let us not be lied to the world that retire, uh, sorry, do the best you can now, save all that you have, retire, take a boat, sail, or kakwa shambayako ka. I mean, sorry, take your farm, get a good land, build a house, retire well and sleep. No. As Christians, even after you've retired from all your work still, you will remain as empty as ever. Go to God. Seek God. Seek God. For in the presence of the Lord, there are pleasures forevermore. It's not weariness. It is not tiresome. It is glory-filled joy. And nothing in this world can ever take it away from you. Why? Because the one who has given it to you is eternal. And so is his joy. So is his joy. Stop sitting around the table of the world. Sit around the table of God and feast upon his gifts. Stop sitting at the table of the world. Sit around the table of the king. Let's pray. Lord, help us to obey. Help us to turn to you in faith. Help us to hold on to you, to cling to you. And help us to find our satisfaction and our utmost joy in you. Help us to pursue that which is holy, that which is pure, that which is without reproach. O oh Lord, renew our minds that we may no longer be captivated by this world. Be tossed to and from by every appetite that we have that the world seeks to satisfy. But Lord, may we bring it all at your feet, lay it down at your feet and find our satisfaction and our utmost pleasure in your presence. And Lord, may you help us to hope in you. Even when this world disappoints, may our hope remain in you. For only you are our utmost joy. It's in Jesus' name I pray.